Welcome to Hebrew Readers Church. I'm your brother Zachwa, and this is your brother Kasafo. We are going into the laws of the Passover, uh, seeing that we are going into Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread coming next week. We wanted to make this video to prepare everybody so that they knew how to keep the feast and what things that we needed to do and the things that we needed not to do concerning the feast. So, Brother Kasafo, you got anything before we get started? Praise a higher man. Got another Passover coming and getting closer, getting everything together. Praise Yahweh. All right, so let's get started. All right, now that we all have the holy calendar, we can follow along together. For you all that don't, please go to the website to download your free copy. The Passover is on the 14th of this first month. We can always know by the holy calendar. Let's start from Leviticus 23, verse 1 to 3. I mean, 1 to 5, please. All right. And the highest spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feast of Ahiah, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feast. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of Ahia in all your dwellings. No, it's six days and then the seventh is the Sabbath. That's the first week of the year. We're right here today. <laughs> what goes after that? What's in the next week? Continue, please. These are the Feast of Ahia, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. In the 14th day of the first month, at even, is Ahia's Passover. All right, so next week is the Passover. That's what's coming up. So now we know what Ahia said in his law, and we have the calendar to coincide with it. Let's see what Ahia's Passover actually is. Can you read Exodus chapter 12, verse 21, please? Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. So the Passover is actually a lamb. Okay. What's actually required for this lamb? Can you read Exodus chapter 12, verse 5? Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. All right. Can it be a lamb only? You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. All right, so it can be a lamb or a goat without blemish of the first year. Is this feast important? Jubilees 49 and 15, please. And do thou command the children of Israel to observe the Passover throughout their days, every year, once a year, on the day of its sixth time. And it will come for a memorial well pleasing before Ahia, and no plague will come upon them to slay or to smite in that year in which they celebrate the Passover in the season, in every respect according to his command. All right, so this is important because keeping this feast keeps us from the plague and getting attacked, so long as we do it in every respect according to his command. Now that we know that, what are his commands? <laughs> okay, you can go to Jubilee chapter 49, verse 1. And two, please. Remember the commandment which Ahia commanded thee concerning the Passover, that thou shouldest celebrate it in its season on the 14th of the first month. That thou shouldest kill it before it is evening, and that they should eat it by night on the evening of the 15th from the time of the setting of the sun. For on this night, the beginning of the festival and the beginning of the joy, you were eating the Passover in Egypt when all the powers of Mastema had been let loose to slay all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh to the firstborn of the captive maidservants in the mill and to the cattle. All right. So with the Passover, it has to be killed in the evening. So though it's on the Sabbath day, the 14th, we can't actually kill it till the evening time. And then 
we should eat it on the evening of the 15th at the time of the setting of the sun. So that's why mealtime comes in when nighttime's coming in. That's the evening of the 15th going into the next day, which is the first day of unleavened bread. Now we know the time frame when we actually get into doing all our Passover things that pertain to the lamb. And we know the reason being that was the beginning of the festival and of the joy because Batsam was let loose on the firstborn of Egypt while the believers of Israel and the Gentiles were being protected. Now, let's get some more understanding of the laws. Jubilees chapter 49, verse 10 to 14, please. Let the children of Israel come and observe the Passover on the day of its sixth time, on the 14th day of the first month between the evenings, from the third part of the day to the third part of the night. For two portions of the day are given to the light, and a third part to the evening. That is that which Ahia commanded thee, that thou shouldest observe it between the evenings. And it is not right. permissible to slay it during any period of the light, but during a period bordering on the evening, and let them eat it at the time of the evening until the third part of the night. And whatever is left over of all its flesh from the third part of the night and onwards, let them be burnt with fire. So, with understanding the time that we do the Passover, it has to be the third part of the day. So you split the day up into three periods. That third part is when the sun starts setting and it gets light mixed with dark. We cannot start doing Passover activities on the Sabbath during the time of the light. All right? So the, during the early part of the day in the Sabbath, we still treat that as the regular Sabbath. We don't get into doing our Passover preparation. And Ahaya commanded to be observed at that time. And we know it's not permissible to slay it during any part of the light. And the time that we start to eat it is in the time of the evening until a third part of the night. The third part of the night is going in to right as sunrise is coming. As it's still kind of dark, but the sun is coming out. That's the third part of the night. And whatever meat is left from that time forward, we have to burn it. There, we have to burn it with fire. Okay, so that's what we have to do with the lamb. Now we know we can start the feast and when we have to get rid of the lamb in the morning. Let's get some more understanding of what we ought to do with this Passover lamb. Jubilee chapter 49, verse 13 and 14, please. And they shall not cook it with water, nor shall they eat it raw, but roast on the fire. They shall eat it with diligence, its head with the inwards thereof, and its feet they shall roast with fire. And not break any bone thereof, for the children of Israel no bone shall be crushed. For this reason I have commanded the children of Israel to observe the Passover on the day of the sixth time, and they shall not break a bone thereof. For it is a festival day, and a day commanded, and there may be no passing over from day to day, and month to month, but on the day of this festival let it be observed. All right. So can't cook it in water, and we can't eat it raw. Got to roast it with fire. Got to eat it with diligence. Got to cook all of it, and then we can't break any bones. All right. That's what we have to do with the lamb. So now we know what to do pertaining to the Passover lamb or goat itself. Well, where do we have to do all these rites at? Where do we have to perform all these things? Can you read Jubilee chapter 49, verse 16 to 21? And not eat it outside the sanctuary of Ahia. But before the sanctuary of Ahia, and all the people of the congregation of Israel shall celebrate it in its appointed season. All right, so it has to be before the sanctuary of Ahia. We can't eat it outside of the sanctuary. Okay, continue with verse 17 to 21. And every man who hath come up upon this day shall eat it in the sanctuary of your Elohim before Ahia, from 20 years old and upward. For thus it is written and ordained that they should eat it in the sanctuary of Ahia. So it's written and ordained that we eat it in the sanctuary. That's a command we have to keep so that no plague comes upon us. Okay, let's continue, please. And when the children of Israel come into the land which they are to possess, into the land of Canaan, and set up the tabernacle of Ahia in the midst of the land in one of their tribes until the sanctuary of Ahia have been built in the land, let them come and celebrate the Passover in the midst of the tabernacle of Ahia, and let them slay it before Ahia from year to year. 
Okay. So even when they went into the land, they still had to come do it before the tabernacle. Okay. And in the days when the house hath been built in the name of Ahiah in the land of their inheritance, they shall go there and slay the Passover in the evening at sunset at the third part of the day, and they will offer its blood on the threshold of the altar. Uh, okay, so once the temple got built, they still had to, that's now the designated place. You have to go to the temple. There's nowhere else to go but the temple to slay the Passover at evening. And something changed. We don't have to put the blood on the doorpost anymore. The blood has to go on the threshold of the altar. Okay, what else do we have to do? And shall place its fat on the fire which is upon the altar. All right. So in order to do that, we have to go to the altar at the sanctuary to fulfill that command. All right, what else? And they shall eat of his flesh roasted with fire in the court of the house which hath been sanctified in the name of Ahiah. Ah, uh, so now we don't eat the flesh at home anymore. We have to eat it in the court of the house. All right. That means all the brethren of all nations can eat there. Can you read Revelations 11 and 2? But the court, which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. Wow. So the Hebrews and the Gentiles can eat there together in the court of the house as one body. Okay. But what about doing the rites and eating the Passover in the lands of our dispersion? Because there's no temple for us to go to now. Can you read Jubilees 49 and 21? And they may not celebrate the Passover in their cities, nor in any place save before the tabernacle of Ahia, or before his house where his name hath dwelt. And they will not go astray from Ahia. Oh, so it has to be done at the temple. So we can't do it in the lines of our captivity. We can't perform the rites of Passover because the temple has been destroyed where his name dwells. And when you think about it, isn't it the sons of Aaron? They're the only ones that can perform the sacrifices at the temple. So we don't even have the people in the land to do the sacrifices for us. Because anyone else that does it will be put to death at the temple. Can you read Numbers chapter 18, verse 1 and verse 7? Numbers chapter 18, verse 1. And the highest said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. And thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. That's speaking to Aaron and his children. Verse 7. Therefore, thou and thy sons with thee shall keep your priest's office for everything of the altar and within the veil, and ye shall serve. I have given your priest's office unto you as a service of a gift. And the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. Let me see. No one else but save the sons of Aaron can do the sacrifices that pertain to the Passover for us. And we don't have the temple to do the Passover at to sit and eat in the courts of the house. We can't perform the Passover rites with, when pertaining to the lamb in our current situation. Is there anything else pertaining to the feast? Can you read Jubilees 49 and 7? And remember thou this day, all the days of thy life, and observe it from year to year, all the days of thy life, once a year, on its day, according to all the law thereof, and do not adjourn it from day to day, from month to month. For it is an eternal ordinance, an engraving on the heavenly tables regarding all the children of Israel that they should observe it every year on this day once a year throughout all their generations. And there is no limit of days, for this is ordained forever. And the man who is free from uncleanness and doeth not come to observe it on occasion of his day, so as to bring an acceptable offering before Ahia, and to eat and to drink before Ahia on the day of his festival, that man who is clean and clothes, clothes at hand will be cut off, because he offered not the oblation of Ahia in this appointed season. He will take the guilt upon himself. So we also have to be clean in order to do the Passover rites, to perform the sacrifice according to the law. 
And seeing as though we're dispersed, there is mercy because I have said, if the man is close at hand, he'll be cut off. We're sent away from our home. So I understand the situation we're in. So we're not guilty of not performing the Passover because the necessary things to keep the commandments are not in place for us at this time. Let's see what other ordinances there are for Passover. Can you read Exodus chapter 12, verse 43 to 49? Exodus chapter 12, verse 43. And Ahia said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover, that shall no stranger eat thereof. But every man's servant that is brought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. So even if someone's bought with your money and a part of your household, they have to be circumcised to eat that actual Passover lamb. All right. What about the strangers that some people just come live with the Israelites just because they love Allah? Hayim? What about those? Can you read verse 48 and 49? And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover of Ahiah, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. One law shall be to him that is a home-born, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. All right. So in order to eat the actual Passover lamb, one has to be circumcised, regardless of who one is. All right. Now we know we have to be clean. We have to be nigh. And we have to be circumcised to keep the actual laws of the Passover. So in order for us to actually perform Passover rites, we would need the temple, the altar, and the sons of Aaron to be in Jerusalem to perform the sacrifice. Now, there is an altar. They built one in December of 2018. But we don't have the temple to eat in the courts. Nor are the sons of Aaron before the altar that was built in Israel to minister. So we can't do the rites of the Passover lamb. Yet, thankfully, our Passover has already been sacrificed for us once and for all. Can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Amen. So all that stuff, thankfully, we're not held in bondage to the rites, because Yahweh, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. When it, the, and that's pertaining to the rites of the Lamb. Can you also read Hebrews? Chapter 9, verse 28, to see that he made that sacrifice for us all. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Well, he gave his life for us. And we still have to be clean to partake in him, even though he has turned things to the spiritual side of it, making that sacrifice and offering his blood as of a lamb without blemish on the altar of Allah in heaven, now that things have become spiritual, we also have to be clean and circumcised spiritually so that we may partake in our Lord, Yahweh Christ. Can you read Titus chapter 1, verse 15? Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. So now, understanding the cleanness that we have to come to Passover in, let us purge our hearts and cleanse our minds and be believing so that we may not be defiled and kept back from the sacrifice of our Lord Yache. Also, let us be circumcised in our hearts that we may be circumcised to partake in him. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 to 13, please. And whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands? and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So we have to stop sinning to put on that circumcision of the heart so that we may partake in our Lord's Passover for us. 
But how do we put off the body of sin? We have to stop sinning, yes, but what else must be done? Can you read verse 12, please? Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of Elohim, who have raised him from the dead. Ah, uh -huh, so we have to be baptized as well. That's a part of the circumcision and the cleanness that we need to partake in our Lord. Can you read verse 13? And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. This forgiveness comes by belief in him and being baptized, as the people are doing even before. Can you read Matthew 3 and 6, please? And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. John started it, and as we know from the core doctrine and the principles of Christ in Hebrews chapter 6, that the doctrine of baptism continued to be a part of the ministry, baptism and repentance from dead works. So when we've been baptized, we now can do the communion to show the Lord's death till he comes. Can you read 1 Corinthians 11 and 26? For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. People that are baptized in the name of the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Yache the Son can do communion. Not any other names, because there is only one name in which we may be saved. Can you read Acts 4 and 12? Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Let's see evidence that baptism is necessary for communion. Can you read Acts of Thomas, chapter 27 and 29, please? Okay. Being therefore wholly set upon the apostle, both the king, Gundaforus, and Gad, his brother, followed him and departed not from him at all. And they also received them that had need, giving to all and refreshing all. And they besought him that they also might henceforth receive the seal of the word, saying to him, Seeing that our souls are at leisure and eager toward Elohim, give us the seal. For we have heard you say that the Elohim whom you preach knows his own sheep by his seal. And the apostle said to them, I also rejoice and entreat you to receive the seal, and to partake with me in this Eutychus, and blessing of the Lord, and to be made perfect therein, so there's a seal we need to receive, and then we need to partake in the Eucharist and blessings of the Lord to be made perfect. Let's see what this seal is. Continue, please. For this is the Lord and Elohim of all, even Yahweh Christ, whom I preach. And he is the Father of truth, to whom I have taught you to believe. And he commanded them to bring oil that they may receive the seal by the oil. They brought right. the oil, therefore, and lighted many lamps, for it was night. All right. Jump to the end of 27 there. And the apostle arose and sealed them. Baptism. So baptism was the seal that they received. When you go read the book of Acts, you see that he had to baptize them in water. Then, after he baptized them, he preached to them again. And then they received the Eucharist, which is communion. Jump to chapter 29 there, please. And when he had spoken this, some of them that stood by said, It is time for the creditor to receive the debt. And he said to them, He that is lord of the debt desire always to receive more, but let us give him that which is due. And he blessed them, and took bread and oil, herbs and salt, and blessed and gave to them. So we see through scripture, they had to be baptized in order to receive communion. And this is to help us understand in order to do communion, what we have to do first, lest we offend the Lord. I'm sorry, offend the Lord. We have to be baptized and of the right heart to eat this communion. Can you read Colossians chapter 11, verse 27 to 30, please? Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. 
But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So we see, this is an important matter. This is not a light thing for us. This actually affects us physically as well. Can you continue, please? For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So hopefully, brothers and sisters, we understand we have to take heed. We know we have to be baptized in the true name of salvation in the Father and the Holy Spirit. And we have to come with a good heart in order to partake in a communion and the sacrifice of our Lord, Yahweh. We warn everyone not to do communion unworthily because people's health actually get affected by it. The communion is a sacrifice we offer before the altar of Allah I am in heaven. This is our replacement for the Passover lamb that we are unable to do due to our circumstances and the requirements of the law. Let's see that the sacrifice of communion is offered before Allah I am in heaven. Acts of Peter, chapter 2, please. Now they brought unto Paul bread and water for the sacrifice, that he might make prayer and distribute it to everyone among whom it befell that a woman named Rufina desired she also to receive the Eutychus at the hands of Paul, to whom Paul, filled with the spirit of Elohim, said as she drew near, Rufina, thou comest not worthily unto the altar of Elohim. Notice Rufina was an example of how not coming worthily can affect a person. And the spirit had mercy to stop her before she even partook in it and the Lord's grace. Yet we're going to see what happened for the increase of her faith and those that were around. Continue in chapter 2, please. To whom Paul, filled with the spirit of Allah, said as she drew near, Rufina, thou comest not worthily unto the altar of Allah, arising from beside one that is not thine husband, but an adulterer. And assayest to receive the Eutychus of Elohim. For behold, Satan shall trouble thine heart and cast thee down in the sight of all them that believe in the Lord, that they which see and believe may know that they have believed in the living Elohim, the searcher of hearts. But if thou repent of thine act, he is faithful that is able to blot out thy sin and set thee free from this sin. But if thou repent not, while thou art yet in the body, devouring fire and outer darkness shall receive thee forever. And immediately Rafina fell down, being stricken with palsy from her head unto the nails of her feet. And she had no power to speak given her, for her tongue was bound. So we see how this stuff is very serious. And that's why we go into this so brothers and sisters can understand it's not a light thing. Right. We have another example of someone coming to partake in communion unworthily and the effect they had. Can you read Acts of Thomas, chapter 51, please? Now, there was a certain young man who committed a nefarious deed. He came and partook of the Eutychus, and his two hands withered so that he could no longer put them to his mouth. When those present saw him, they told the apostle what had happened. And the apostle called him and said, Tell me, my son, and be not afraid of what you have done before you came here. For the Eutychus of the Lord hath convicted you. For this gift, by entering many, brings healing, especially to those who come in faith and love. But you it hath withered away. And what hath happened hath happened not without justification. And the young man convicted by the Eutychus of the Lord came up fell at the apostles' feet, and besought him, and said, An evil deed has been done by me, while as I thought to do something good. So there we have scriptural understanding. When we come in faith and love, it's for healing, deliverance even. But if we don't come right, it, it convicts us, and we'll see the effects in our body. So this lets us know we can't partake in the communion unworthily, nor can the unclean partake in the sacrifices. So we have to get our heart and minds right 
And if, as you actually said, if you bring your sacrifice and your brother has ought against you, go deal with that situation and then come offer your sacrifices. So we have to make sure there's no bitterness or malice or grudging towards anyone before partaking in a communion. And we have to be baptized as the scripture is showing the true names of the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. So hopefully you can understand that baptism is needed. A clean heart is required for communion. And we know we cannot actually do the rites that are required for the Passover lamb for the reasons aforementioned, like the temple not being there and the sons of Aaron not being there to minister the priest office. Yet, and still, we can just get some form of clean meat to eat in light of the feast for memorial's sake and have a nice dinner for the feast's sake. Now, since we're celebrating this Passover, Though we cannot do the rites of the lamb sacrifice physically, we can still do the things that pertain to the feast otherwise. Uh, can you read Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 3? Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith. Even the bread of affliction, for thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. So, remembering the Exodus is the reason we eat unleavened bread of affliction. We must continue doing that. And thankfully, we have the understanding of why we're doing it to remember what transpired in the past. Verse 4 of Deuteronomy 16. And there shall be no leavened bread seen with thee in all thy coast seven days. Neither shall there anything of the flesh which thou sacrificest the first day at even remain all night unto the morning. We know we can't do that sacrifice, so we don't have to worry about that. After Passover night, we have to remove all yeast bread from our homes. During Passover night, what else are we commanded? Can you read Exodus 12 and 8, please? And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. So though we can't do the Passover flesh, roast with fire, yet, we can eat uh, unleavened bread to remember the Exodus. And also we can eat the bitter herbs as we're commanded. So with the bitter herbs and unleavened bread, you can also put dressing on your herbs too, because it's not against what he commanded to be done. So you can throw a salad dressing on there if you like. What else is commanded for us to do? Can you read Exodus chapter 12, verse 11? And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is a highest Passover. Now, is that for everybody to do? Let's see who he was actually talking to to see who has to eat it with their loins girded, their shoes on their feet, their staff in their hand, and eating it in haste. Can you read Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, please? Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Oh, okay. So this is for the men, the head of the household that has to have his shoes on his feet, his loins girded, and his staff in his hand. He's the one that has to do that to, according to the commandments of the Passover and eating it in haste. Now, concerning our dinner for the feast, we can eat and drink whatever we like for the feast, so long as there's no leaven, which is yeast, in the food that we eat. The people ate bread and grains in the feast, for example, so you know there were multiple things being ate. Can you read Joshua chapter 5, verse 10 to 12, please? And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. Did you notice that? Remember, the law says seven days you have to eat unleavened bread, right? Correct. So we just have to make sure we do what's commanded to be done. They ate the unleavened cakes to fulfill the law. And they also ate parched corn in the selfsame day, which is fried grains to see that you can eat other things. You just have to fulfill the eating of the unleavened bread or unleavened cakes for the seven days of the feast. 
All right, continue, please. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan in that year. All right. In continuation, we see that they had unleavened bread, and that lets us know we have to at least eat unleavened bread or cakes for the seven days of the feast. That's what's commanded. Can you read Exodus 12 and 20, please? You shall eat nothing leavened in all your habitations shall you eat unleavened bread. So we have to make sure there's no yeast in what we're eating. All right, brothers and sisters, that's the command. In all our habitations, we eat unleavened bread. And the unleavened bread can be made of different grains. All right. Can you read Ezekiel 4 and 9, please? Take thou also unto thee wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and fitches, and put them in one vessel, and make thee bread thereof, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon thy side. Three hundred and ninety days shalt thou eat thereof. So we went there just to see how you can make your bread out of different grains. Now, mind you, brothers and sisters, there are some breads that like are made out of like potato starch. That's eating potatoes. Right. You have to actually eat unleavened bread made of grain to fulfill the command. All right. So make sure your bread is actually made from grain <laughs> that you eat, that it's unleavened. All right. So long as we are sure to eat unleavened bread seven days, along with whatever else we eat, we're doing what was commanded for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Exodus chapter 13, verse 7, please. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee. Neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. So we eat the unleavened bread and... No leavened bread can be with us. We cannot have leavened bread in our homes. We have to remove all leaven in our quarters. Leaven is yeast. So we have to remove that ingredient. After the Passover night in the morning is when we have to remove all the leaven and yeast from the house. Can you read Exodus 12 and 15, please? Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever there eateth was, leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. That commandment is important. So you see, from the first day, we have to put leaven out of our houses, get the yeast out, and be sure not to eat leavened bread. Pay attention to that so that we don't get cut off. We can drink any clean drink we like, just as the people had drinks during the feast too. This helps us understand there was no law concerning our drinks for the feast. Can you read Jubilees chapter 49, verse 6, please? And all Israel was eating the flesh of the Paschal lamb, and drinking the wine, and was lauding and blessing, and giving thanks to Ahayalahim of their fathers, and was ready to go forth from under the yoke of Egypt and from the evil bondage. So there we see they were drinking wine. That helps know that there was no restriction to drinks that the people had. All right, I have made no mention of it, therefore we can drink as we like. Just make sure the drink's clean. Be careful what ingredients they have in that stuff. There are no laws against what we drink, so our drinks can be any juice or wine. All right, hopefully that helps. Preferably, you probably want to do 100% juice <laughs> to make sure you don't get messed up by anything. You can also put dressing on your bitter herbs and eat other things during the feast because we are commanded to eat bitter herbs and unleavened bread. But he didn't restrict us to only eating bitter herbs and unleavened bread. All right. Just make sure there's no leaven in your food, no leaven in your bread. Okay. We have to remain indoors and then go home in the morning. If we are at our friends, we have to remain there and then go home in the morning. And if we're at home, we're already home. There's nowhere to go until in the morning. Can you read Exodus chapter 12, verse 22? And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel on the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. That's why they stayed home in the Exodus. Let's confirm that 
they still remained where they were even when they held a feast at the sanctuary. Can you read Deuteronomy 16 and 7, please? And thou shalt roast and eat it in the place which Ahiah the Elohim shall choose. And thou shalt turn in the morning and go unto thy tent. So they also remained in the courts of the house and then turned to their homes in the morning. Now for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we just all went over Passover stuff. Now what about the Feast of Unleavened Bread that runs for seven days? This is really simple. Deuteronomy 16 and 8, please. Six days that shall eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day shall, shall be, be a solemn assembly to a higher the Elohim. Thou shalt do no work therein. Is that simple? Seven days eat unleavened bread. Make sure you eat some. That's the feast of unleavened bread. And then on the seventh day, which is the next Sabbath, the week after next week is a holy convocation. We can cook up and feast and have whatever we like so long as there's no leaven. No leavened bread. And that would be that feast. And we do no work therein because it's a holy convocation. And as you all know, the Sabbath that's coming up for Passover, it's a Sabbath. So there's no work to be done in that time as well. Make all your preparations, get your food and everything you like before next Sabbath. And remember, it's a double feast. That Saturday and Sunday is a feast day. So you all prepare for that. And then the next week after that, when unleavened bread is coming, that Sabbath is going to be a holy convocation wherein we can cook on the Sabbath to make your preparations before that Sabbath as well. And in between the seven days of unleavened bread, you have the first day of the week, which is Sunday next week. That's a feast day. No work may be done. From Monday to Friday is regular days. All you have to do is make sure you eat unleavened bread. And you can eat whatever else you're eating. Just don't have leaven in the things that you eat in the, in the unleavened bread. And then that Sabbath that comes is a feast day and you don't have 11 as well or eat 11 bread. And we would have done what Ahaya asked us to do. And in closing, remember, don't try to sacrifice anything here in the lands of our captivity or in our respective lands that we live because the sanctuary is where this sacrifice are supposed to be done and the sons of Aaron are supposed to do them, both of which we are not capable of doing at this time to fulfill a command. Thankfully, we have Yache, our Passover, that sacrifice for us, and we get um, baptized in the true name so that we can partake in that. All right. Can you read Leviticus chapter 17, verse 1 to 9 to understand what will happen if you try to do sacrifices and don't bring it to the sanctuary? All right. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 1. And the highest spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, and unto his sons, and unto all the children of Israel, and say unto them, This is the thing which Ahiah hath commanded, saying, What man soever there be of the house of Israel that killeth an ox, or lamb, or goat in the camp, or that killeth it out of the camp, and bring it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer an offering unto Ahiah before the tabernacle of Ahiah, blood shall be imputed unto that man. He hath shed blood. And that man shall be cut off from among his people. That is very straight for us to know why we don't do that. And you have, when you go into the scriptures to have the testimonies for evidence, you had Tobit. He was in the land of Nineveh. And during the Feast of Pentecost, he didn't do any sacrifice at home. He just had a good dinner prepared for him to eat to, in respect of the law. And then also the... People during the Babylonian captivity, I think it was the book of Baruch in the Apocrypha, where they sent money back to the people in Jerusalem to sacrifice for them, to show that the people didn't do sacrifices in the foreign lands, to help us understand we're not to do it as well at this time. Continue, please. To the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, even that they may bring them unto Ahiah, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priests, and offer them for peace offerings unto Ahiah. And the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of Ahiah, the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and burn the fat for a sweet savor unto Ahiah. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils, after whom they have gone a whoring. This shall be a statue forever unto them throughout their generations. Brothers and sisters, this is a statue forever. 
So for the Israelites, that there are people that still do animal sacrifices. You can find it in sub-Saharan Africa. And I think the natives still practice it as well in, the, in different forms. We have to be mindful not to do this thing because it's a statute forever. All right, the last verse, please. Last two verses. And thou shalt say unto them, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the stranger for sojourn among you, that offereth a burnt offering or sacrifice, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, to offer it unto Ahiah, even that man shall be cut off from among his people. So with that, we know this is for all of us, brothers and sisters. And thankfully, we have Yachar Passover that sacrificed for us. And hopefully, this was edifying to understand the laws of the Passover and what we are to do for unleavened bread. You got anything, Zachwa? Just to, just to clarify, um, on the Passover, going from the 14th into the 15th day, uh, when we're about to go into the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that day, can you make a nice dinner with the bitter herbs and the um, and the unleavened bread? Absolutely. So what meat you can, can you, you can eat on that you, day? On that day, because that thank you for bringing that up because we can't do the actual Passover sacrifice. So so long as we just have clean meat, it doesn't matter what meat we have. You can have lamb, goat, beef. This is what we can do for the feast, and you can do it as you like because it's a feast day. The only thing we have to be mindful of is avoid that leaven. Do not have leaven in our bread and leaven in the things that we eat. All right. So that clarifies that for everyone. Yes, thanks. That was a good final thing to go into. <laughs> that is good. So hopefully that's everybody has an understanding of that and everybody can enjoy the Passover day and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yeah. All right. And brothers and sisters, we had former videos up before and I want to apologize. I messed up. I have to confess my fault before the congregation. The teachings were not accurate. Thankfully, it didn't lead anybody to sin. Praise the Lord for that. But it was not right. And I apologize. This here, this teaching is the simple truth of what pertains to the Passover. All right. Now, how you be with you all? all right, well, Thank you for your prayers. Uh, and, uh, forehand, we go ahead and we pray that everybody has a wonderful Passover. A wonderful feast of unleavened bread. We will see you guys next weekend, Ohio willing. And uh, we just hope everybody prepares for it. So, shout out for the child and family. Peace. HRC, 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 HRC. Hebrew readers, Hebrew readers, Hebrew readers, church.